Hello everyone and welcome back to the OpenGL 3D game tutorial series. In this 7th episode we will see how to render our first 3D cube in OpenGL. In particular we will see what vertices to place in the vertex buffer in order to render our 3D cube, how to create the element buffer object in order to optimize the usage of vertices through the so-called indices, and in the end how to create a projection matrix in such a way we can project vertices from 3D space to screen space. As always, we will face three main parts, requirements, design and implementation of all the necessary things to render a 3D cube in OpenGL. Let's start with the requirements. We need a C++ IDE, in this series we use Visual Studio on Windows and Qt Creator on macOS and Linux. The target platforms are Windows, macOS and Linux. The target graphics API is OpenGL and the last but not least, a bit of knowledge of C++ programming language is recommended. Now we can start the design part. What's the problem to solve today? We want to render a 3D cube in OpenGL. In order to do that, the first thing to do is to set up a buffer of vertices. The last time we have managed to render a quadrilateral with four vertices by using the triangle strip mode. But today the things start to be a bit more tricky. Let's see this image. A cube is a 3D model composed of six faces that have all the same dimension. If we analyze further this image, we can also see that the cube has eight vertices. That means we can place those eight vertices inside our vertex buffer and use them to render our 3D cube. There is a problem though. The vertex buffer alone is not enough. Usually in order to render a 3D cube with only the vertex buffer, we should make six vertices for each face, for a total of 36 vertices. Luckily we have another way to handle this situation, an approach based on the element buffer object. The element buffer object is a memory buffer where a series of indices are placed sequentially. Each index of this buffer refers to a specific vertex placed inside the vertex buffer. In an element buffer, when we use the triangle's least rendering mode, each three sequential indices correspond to a triangle. For example, here we can see that the three sequential red numbers will make the red triangle. Instead, the blue numbers correspond to the blue triangle. So, through the usage of both the vertex and element buffers, we can reuse the same vertices to build different triangles, and consequently, we reduce drastically the amount of memory used by the vertex buffer. So far, so good. Now we have to understand how to compute the coordinates of the 8 vertices to place in the vertex buffer. Our cube is featured by a width, a height and a depth of 1 unit. The center of the cube, also called pivot point, is placed at the origin, that is the point with x0, y0 and z0. Let's see this coordinate system. Here each face of the grid have a length of 0.5 unit. In order to create a cube with a length of 1 unit along each axis and a pivot point at the origin, we need to figure it as in this image. Here we have half of the cube placed in the negative area and the other half in the positive area. This is done for each axis. Now that the coordinate system is ready, we can easily find out the various coordinates of each vertex. Very well, now that we have gathered the 8 vertices, we can finally place all of them in the vertex buffer. Let's mark each vertex with an index, in order to use them later in the element buffer. Good, the vertex buffer is ready. We can start to create the element buffer. Let's start to place the first three indices. In this way, we create the first triangle of the front face. Then we place the next three indices that create the second and last triangle of the face. 
At this point, we have only to repeat this process for each phase of the queue. If we have questions, doubts, or comments about this topic, don't hesitate to leave them in the comment section of this video or in the Discord server. The link to the Discord server is available in the video description. Also, if you find this tutorial helpful, please consider to support their development on Patreon. Every single contribution makes the difference, regardless the amount. Very well, we have gathered all the necessary information to start the implementation. As first thing, let's create the OVAC3 class in math folder. Let's copy past OVAC4 class in OVAC3 header file, since it is nearly the same class. Here, let's rename the class and let's remove the destructor. Here, it is completely useless. Let's do the same thing even in the OVAC4 class. At this point, let's remove the W attribute. Very well, we can start to create the OVAC2 class. Let's do the same thing. So far, so good. Now we can go to all game class and in the on create method, we can start to create the list of vertices of our cube. So let's include the OVAC free class. And let's start to create an array of OVAC free elements. Here we can start to place the various vertices computed during the introduction. Let's comment the previous array of vertices. For now, let's set only the position attribute in the attributes list and let's calculate its value through the size of function. What's next? Well, we have to replace the old array with the new one during the creation of the VBO. Let's improve the computation of the various values. 
through the usage of size of function. The next step to face is to create the array of indices to place inside the element buffer. Let's insert the indices in the way we have seen in the introduction. At this point, we have to create concretely the element buffer in which to place the array of indices. So let's go to all vertex array object class and here let's add a new constructor. This new constructor should accept both a descriptor of the vertex buffer and another descriptor for the element buffer, or we can also call it index buffer. Let's define the index buffer descriptor in the all prerequisites header file. This structure needs only the pointer to the array of indices and the number of indices. Very well, let's go back to Overtex Array object and let's implement the constructor. As first thing, let's rename the data parameter in vbdesk in the first constructor. Now we can start to create the element buffer. Don't forget to call the base constructor in order to create the vertex buffer. Now the procedure of creation of an element buffer is nearly the same one used for the vertex buffer.
Let's add an attribute in order to store the ID of our buffer. At this point, we have to replace the GL array buffer with the GL elements array buffer value. Let's remember to release the element buffer during the destructor. Very well! Now, in order to create this kind of vertex array object, we have to add a further create vertex array object method in the OGraphics engine class. Let's do it! Let's come back to all game class and here let's pass the various element buffers data through the create vertex array object method. At this point, we have to render the cube through the draw triangles method, but now we need to call a special function that considers even the element buffer. In order to do that, let's go to all graphics engine class and let's add a further draw method called draw indexed triangles method. The only thing that changed from the previous draw method is that we have to call GL draw elements instead of GL draw arrays. In the GL draw elements function, we have to pass the triangles rendering mode. The counts of indices. The type of the various indices. In this case, we use an unsigned integer. And in the end, 
the function requires the pointer of the array of indices. Since we have already binded it with the VBO, here we can simply pass a null pointer. Good, we can finally go back to OGain class and call the draw indexed triangles. As a very last step, let's go to the basic vertex shader file and let's comment a bit the code. Let's do the same thing for the fragment shader. Let's see if it works. And it works. At this point, we are able to render our cube on the screen, but there is a problem for. Currently, we are rendering our cube with the same coordinates passed in the vertex buffer that are in 3D space. That's not correct. We should transform those vertices from 3D space to screen space. We have already seen in the third tutorial what is the screen space, that is a 2D space used by the graphics APIs in order to process the various vertices correctly and show the polygons on the screen. This transformation from 3D space to screen space can be easily accomplished by using the so-called projection matrix. The vertices can be projected in various ways, mainly with an orthogonal or perspective projection matrices. We will deepen this topic better in the next tutorials. Today we only need to know that, in order to transform those vertices, we have to multiply our vertex with the world matrix and subsequently with the projection matrix in the vertex shader. In particular today we will see how to use an orthogonal projection matrix. Let's see how to implement it. As first thing, let's go to omat 4 class Let's replace OVAC4 with a more suitable OVAC3 in set translation and set scale methods. Then let's start to implement the set ortho LH that allows to create a left-handed orthogonal projection matrix. For this method, we need the width and height of the viewport area we want to render. Usually these values are based on the width and height of the screen. Then we have to add the near and far plane. Those values allows to define the visible area of the world. Near plane is the minimum value, far plane is the maximum value of this area. We can create the orthogonal projection metric by following the image on the screen. We will deepen the projection matrices topic in the next tutorials.
Very well, let's come back to all game class and let's create the projection matrix. Let's pass the width and height of our display. Multiplied, uh, let's pass the width and height of our display, multiplied with a small factor. This factor allows to zoom in or zoom out the view. Let's set a small value for the near plane and an eye value for the far plane. At this point we have to pass the projection matrix to the shader. So let's go to the uniform buffer data and let's add a further omat 4 attribute. Let's call it projection. So, now we can pass our just created projection matrix in the uniform buffer data object. Now we can finally handle the projection matrix in the vertex shader file. Let's see if it works. And it works. We can see that now we have a more proportioned cube than the previous one. Perfect, as last thing to make the things a bit more interesting, let's color the surface of our cube. To do that, let's go to the OGIN class and in the onCreate method, let's add a further array of OVEC2 elements. Here we are calling the array text course list. But currently we have to consider this array as a list of colors composed of only the red and green values. For example, the first OVEC2 element is a black color, the second one is a green color, and so on. So far so good, now in order to handle the vertices and the colors all together we have to define a further data structure that we can call vertex, in which we place the two attributes. At this point we have to create a further array of vertex elements, in which we link the vertices and colors together.
let's organize the vertices list. For each vertex element, we define the position of the vertex and its related color. Here, for each four vertex elements, we define a particular phase of the cube. We can easily find out the correct indices to use by following the image on the screen. So far, so good. Now, since we are going to use a different array of vertices, we have to update the array of indices accordingly. Let's add the text chord attribute in the attributes list. Let's remember that in this case we are considering text chord attribute as color attribute. Then let's replace positions list with vertices list in the create vertex array object method. In the end, in the vertex shader, let's recover the attributes and code we have commented previously. The only thing to change is the type of color attribute that now is back to. And let's pass to vertex out color the text code .x and the text code .y values. Let's see if it works. And 
it seems it doesn't work properly. What's happened? This kind of strange effect is shown because the OpenGL graphics API is currently cooling the front faces and at the same time is rendering the back faces. Actually, it should be the other way around. So we have to find a way to tell to OpenGL to render only the front faces. To do this, let's go to all graphics engine class and let's implement the set face cooling method. Here we should pass an enumerator called OCoolType. Let's implement it in the Opera Requisites Either file. In the new versions of C, the usage of Enum class is recommended, so let's use it for all our Enums. The benefits of this type of Enum will be clear in a few moments. Now let's add the back face, front face, and both values. Let's come back to all graphics engine and let's start to implement the set face cooling method. Here we're starting to have errors. These errors are caused by the enum classes just used. Enum classes prevent the usage of enumerators as a simple integral values. In this way, we are constrained to use the exact types defined in the enumerator. Let's implement the set face cooling method. The OpenGL function we have to use in order to set the cool mode is called GL cool mode. Let's use the method just created in the all game class. Let's see if it finally works. And it works.
The winding order is the order through which we have organized our vertices. In our case, we have organized the vertices in clockwise order. But in OpenGL, the default order selected is the anti-clockwise order. So we have to tell to OpenGL the order in which we have placed our vertices. In such a way, it can render our cube correctly. To do this, let's implement the set winding order method. And as we have already done with set phase cooling, let's create another enumerator called O winding order. Here, let's define the clockwise and anti-clockwise types. Let's implement this method and let's use the method GL front face. Let's use it in all game class and let's set the clockwise order. Let's see if it works. And it works! Now the phases are rendered in the right direction. That's all for now folks, today we have seen how to render our first 3D cube in OpenGL. The next time we will see how to create an initial version of the entity system. I hope you enjoyed this video, see you soon, thanks for watching.